Ladies and gentlemen, κυρίες και κύριοι, είμαι καταρχήν μεγάλη τιμή για μένα να συντονίσω αυτό το, το κλείσιμο, αν θέλετε, την τελευταία συζήτηση ε, αυτού του, του πάνελ. Ε, να πω έτσι ένα-δύο προσωπικά λόγια μόνο. Είμαι διπλά χαρούμενος και είναι τιμή για μένα, διότι το, το Bar College είναι το παλιό μου σχολείο, το παλιό μου κολέγιο. Και ο Δημήτρης Παπαδημητρίου, ο οποίος μας άφησε έτσι με πολύ αισιόδοξη νότα με την ανάλυση του, είναι ο άνθρωπος ο οποίος είναι υπεύθυνο για το γεγονός ότι πήγα στην Αμερική και σπούδασα στην Αμερική και ήταν μέντορας μου για πολλά χρόνια, αλλά για να είμαι και απόλυτα σαφής, δεν έχει καμία ευθύνη για τη μετέπειτα εξέλιξή μου. Ε, από εκεί και πέρα, θα ήθελα να... Ξέρω ότι η συζήτηση δεν θα είναι απολύτως πολιτική, βέβαια, η οποία θα ακολουθήσει. Ε, με εξαιρέσει, αλλά εγώ τουλάχιστον θα ήθελα να διατυπώσω μερικά α, ερωτήματα, τα οποία τα θεωρώ κρίσιμα για το μέλλον της Ευρώπης. Ξεκινώντας, βέβαια, από το πολύ θεμελιώδες ερώτημα κατά πόσον το ευρώ είναι βιώσιμο στη σημερινή του μορφή και με αυτά τα οποία βλέπουμε να γίνονται στην Ιταλία, την Ισπανία, ακόμα και στην Γαλλία τις τελευταίες μέρες. Το δεύτερο είναι κατά πόσον οι περίφημε αυτές μεταρρυθμίσεις, οι οποίες πρέπει να γίνονται στην Ευρώπη ή έπασε εδώ οι οποίες απαιτούνται από την των αγορών να γίνουν στην Ευρώπη, κατά πόσο είναι συμβατές με τη δημοκρατία, όπως την ξέρουμε στην Ευρώπη, τουλάχιστον μετά τον πόλεμο. Το τρίτο ερώτημα είναι κατά πόσο η Γερμανία μπορεί να παίξει το ρόλο που καλό ή κακό τη έλαχε στο να βγει η Ευρώπη από αυτή την κρίση. Και το τέταρτο ερώτημα είναι τι μπορούμε να μάθουμε από την Αμερικάνικη εμπειρία των τελευταίων ετών στο πώς χειρίστηκε δηλαδή, τη δική της κρίση. Αυτά τα τέσσερα έτσι, ερωτήματα τα θέτω γενικώ προ συζήτηση. Έχουμε πει θα έχουμε περίπου 15 λεπτά ο κάθε ομιλητή και μετά θα έχουμε κάποιε ερωτήσει από εσά. Βέβαια, μου είπαν ότι πρέπει να τελειώσουμε γύρω στου 8 και 4, οπότε δεν έχουμε και πάρα πολύ χρόνο. Ε, να κάνω μια γρήγορη εισαγωγή. Έχουμε μαζί μα την κυρία Κέρστιν Μπερνότ, η οποία είναι καθηγήτρια στο Πανεπιστήμιο Χέρντι Οικονομικών. Έχουμε μαζί μα τον κύριο Χέλτουικ, ο οποίο είναι διευθυντή του Ινστιτούτου Max Planck. Έχουμε μαζί μα επίση τον κύριο Λουκά Τσούκαλη, ο οποίο είναι καθηγητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο τη Αθήνα και επισκέπτη καθηγητή στο King's College και πρόεδρο του ΕΛΙΑΜΕΠ. Και βεβαίω έχουμε μαζί μα τον κύριο Δραγασάκη, ο οποίο θα μιλήσει και τελευταίο γιατί θα κάνει μια έτσι, πολιτική παρέμβαση περισσότερο, αντιπρόεδρο τη Βουλή. Ε, και να ξεκινήσω με την κυρία Μπενότ. Let me first thank the organizers for having invited me to this conference. I think that so many people are still here Saturday evening is a good proof that there's urgent need to talk about the future of Greece, but not only about Greece, but the future of the Eurozone. <clears throat> so I will in my talk not talk specifically about Greece, but more about the future of the uh, uh, European Monetary Union. Um, so what we actually discussed this topic today in, our, in two other presentations of uh, the speakers today. What I will propose is the introduction of a cyclical transfer mechanism as a stabilization tool in the European Monetary Union. So I have to stress that this mechanism is not actually a tool to solve the crisis that we are currently facing. It's more potential to provide more stability to the European Monetary Union in the future. Um, this presentation is actually based on a policy note that I wrote together with uh, Philip Engler from the Free University in Berlin. And you can download this uh, policy report also from uh, the website of DRW Berlin. Um, so what was the motivation actually to set up this um, proposal? The reason is that uh, the European Monetary Union is very unique. So the member states of the European Monetary Union have committed to common monetary policy, while fiscal policy remains completely in the responsibility of the individual governments. Up to now, there is actually no example of countries that actually have tried to reach such a high level of monetary integration without fiscal or political uh, centralization. And what we are actually facing right now in the euro area is an example that it's a kind of tried and error 
um, mechanism that we are just facing also. Um, certainly, a monetary union has benefits. We discussed them yesterday as well. But for sure, a monetary union also comes at some cost. And I think that every, all member countries knew that when they entered the monetary union. Um, the cost actually rests on the fact that in a monetary union, you cannot use monetary and exchange rate policy actually to, as a stabilization tool in the event of asymmetric shocks hitting the individual countries. And on top, it's not only that you cannot use monetary and fiscal policy anymore as a stabilization tool. It might, it's even the case that uh, within a monetary union, um, business cycle divergence actually gets amplified because of the single monetary union. The reason is that uh, uh, the European Central Bank or the Central Bank of, a mon of, of, the, of the monetary union actually always targets average inflation and economic developments of uh, the whole euro area. That means now if in case that we have asymmetric shocks, so we have different developments in inflation and, and economic growth in the member states, that as a consequence, monetary policy will never be optimal for all countries. So monetary policy will be too restrictive for the country in an economic downturn, which is currently Greece, but it will also be too expensive for countries in a more favorable economic situation. That is when you open German newspapers and people are complaining there that the interest rate cut of the ECB two days ago is damaging the German economy. Um, and what you see here in these two pictures, I only picture, uh, show, oh, I haven't. That's a problem when you don't have a screen here, I noticed. So I prepared two uh, figures. So on the left side, you see uh, real GDP growth of a selected group of uh, Eurozone countries. On the right hand side, you see the inflation development in, a, in a selected Eurozone countries. And what you see is that there is substantial heterogeneity. Um, for example, in uh, real growth figures, in the beginning of the last century, Germany was in a recession, so it had negative real growth for uh, th two to three years. Why, for example, Ireland and Greece had quite substa uh, um, substantial real economic growth. So it was exactly the opposite situation than what we, okay, today it's much worse for Greece, but it's in principle the same um, problem, but only reverse that we are facing currently. And as I said, so today it's the opposite, so that Greece is facing negative uh, real growth while other countries are have showing positive growth. Same holds for inflation. So you see there's a huge heterogeneity in the inflation figures among these member countries. And all that means, if the central bank is now targeting inflation, of the, uh, has the mandate to, 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 for price stability, uh, you see it's very difficult in a monetary union and they always orient on the, on the average, on the Eurozone average. Um, an important element in monetary policy to bring business cycles closer together is surely factor mobility, so uh, capital, labor, and goods mobility, but this alone can sh surely not um, be sufficient actually to achieve the desired level of cyclical stabilization. So in the, there's a broad literature actually uh, that came up in the 60s already that suggests, um, or so it's a literature on the optimal currency area, that would suggest now that as long as the European markets are not fully integrated, EMU needs alternative shock absorbing instruments to dampen asymmetric um, business cycle shocks. So what could be these alternative instruments if we don't have monetary policy or, or exchange rate policy at hand? One obvious candidate is of course national fiscal policy. So here the idea is, whoops, sorry is um, that governments should follow a counter-cyclical fiscal policy to stabilize economic fluctuations of a country. So that means collecting surpluses in booms and making deficits in, in um, times of recessions. So this morning I, I once heard a sentence saying that 
the Germans are obsessed to collect fiscal surpluses. That's absolutely, I think no German politician would sign that. It's more that exactly you should be able to use fiscal national fiscal policy in a flexible way, so in a counter-cyclical way, to, you, to make deficits in times of recessions, to stimulate the economy, and to actually save in times of um, economic uh, booms. However, the experience of recent years shows that national fiscal policy does not fulfill this function sufficiently. So there are different reasons. One reason, obvious reason is also that uh, fiscal policymakers n not always have the right information at hand about the cyclical position of the country. But another problem that we are currently actually seeing is that due to a lack of fiscal discipline and also as a result of the f financial crisis, the fiscal situation of the countries has uh, deteriorated. So countries have a huge bulk of uh, government debt. And that means that they have actually no room for maneuver. So, Greece is not able to, to lower taxes and increase expenses, uh, uh, expenses actually, because um, they're, they're, yeah, they're actually forced to do the opposite. They, ha they have to run a pro-cyclical fiscal policy because of the, um, the bad fiscal situation. So that means that they are currently not dampening the, economic, the business cycle, but they're amplifying the recession. So what would be an uh, additional stabilization instrument? We, of course, in a monetary union, you always have also the uh, possibility to introduce international insurance system against asymmetric cyclical income fluctuations. So you notice I use now a different phrase than in the title of, the, of my presentation. Uh, so I try to avoid to talk about transfer mechanisms because that is an Surely a word that uh, it's a taboo and in, in, will be a taboo uh, among the German population, I guess. So we should better talk about an insurance system against asymmetric shocks. Um, the basic idea of that system is that if a country is in a favorable cyclical economic situation compared to the average of the uh, euro area, it will receive payments from the compensation scheme and if it's in a, a if a country is opposite in an unfavorable cyclical um, position, it will actually be a net uh, um, receiver of uh, payments out of that um, payment system or insurance system. So to stress, this goal is uh, the goal of such a system is not to achieve balance of income or to, general, uh, to, to balance the general living standards among EMU countries because this would actually mean that we have permanent transfers from one uh, country to the other. It's, the goal is more compensation payment to, int to introduce it to balance uh, our business cycles. So exactly the task that national monetary policy or exchange rate policy is not able to do anymore. Um, so that means in a purely cyclical transfer mechanism, each country would be both recipient and donor over the entire business cycle, and no permanent transfers would flow in one direction. So that means also when we look back at to, the, in, to, uh, to the last 20 years, or 30, 14 years, Germany would have received funding, uh, especially from the southern European countries in the period 2001-2003, where uh, Germany had negative growth, and now it would be the opposite that uh, Greece would be a net uh, um, receiver of these uh, insurance payments. Actually, there, my, my co-author Philip Engler and Simon Folk, they have recently f um, uh, published a study where they model this mechanism within a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, and they show that the introduction of a simple transfer mechanism is actually as effective to, to smooth out asymmetric um, business cycle shocks as a national monetary policy would be. Another um, study by my colleague Henrik Enderlein and, and, and co-authors they run simulations and they find that the average deviation of, from the euro area business cycle would have decreased by around 15 to 40 percent for the period 99 until 2014. So they use projections for 2013 and 14. 
So when you look at the at different federal states or county areas um, embedded in, oops, in um, so I have a different order here, uh, embedded in federal states, uh, like for example the United States of America or Germany, they all actually have such kind of cross-country insurance scheme. So in the US, um, any shortfall of income in a state is compensated by transfers that amounts to between 10 to 40 percent of the loss. So it's, a, it's a quite strong insurance against asymmetric shocks. In the EMU, we don't have such a system yet, and we should honestly consider to, to introduce such a system. To be effective and also implementable, the cyclical insurance scheme should fulfill the following characteristics. So first, the payment should be transferred quickly and on time to serve their stabilizing and synchronizing purposes, because if they come with a delay, and maybe the economy has already recovered, it would be not counter-cyclical, but pro-cyclical. Uh, second, the payment mechanism should be governed by rules to prevent arbitrary political decisions and to increase transparency. So there should be fixed rules when is a country, country a donor, when it, it, it is a recipient. Uh, third, the compensatory mechanism should be oriented to cyclical fluctuations, so not to structural differences or structural growth differences among these, uh, the member countries. And fourth, the transfer mechanism should be accompanied by strong fiscal rules. Such a system should not replace actually sound economic and budgetary policy. The reason, as I explained before, national fiscal policy is also an important tool actually to smooth the business cycle in by actually um, running counter-cyclical national fiscal policies. And fifth, the participation in a compensation system should be subject to conditions such as uh, structural reforms as a kind of incentive mechanism. Um, such a system could be implemented in different ways. There is a very good paper by Jürgen von Hagen and Charles uh, Wiblosch, uh, published in 2007, that described these different um, uh, implementations in more detail. So the first um, alternative would be to, to introduce a direct fiscal transfer payment system. So that would mean that all member countries of the monetary union would pay a small fraction of their tax revenues, which is closely linked to the business cycle, so for example the value-added tax into a joint European fund. And these payments would be redistributed um, to the individual member states in relation to their per capita potential growth. So the payments into the system are linked to the business cycle and the outflows are actually uh, constant. This would actually give governments the possibility to run a counter-cyclical fiscal policy without burdening national budgets. So that would also help to, uh, to actually um, uh, reconcile with the stability and growth pact. And the more uh, synchronous the business cycles of the member states are, the less, uh, the, uh, the fewer payments actually are made. So they, it's really only in compensation for asymmetric business cycle shocks. A second alternative would be the introduction of an indirect, indirect transfer mechanism. So for example, by the introduction of a European unemployment insurance scheme parallel to the national insurance system. So here the idea is that employees pay part of their wages into a European unemployment insurance fund and in the event of unemployment they receive compensation payments from the fund plus payments from the national scheme. So that means that the total amount of unemployment aid can still, be, can still vary between uh, the different member states. Important is that only short-term unemployment should be covered and that by a limited duration of payments, because only that guarantees that um, on, only the cyclical element of unemployment is uh, actually addressed and not the structural unemployment. How such a system could look like, that's uh, shown here in this graph uh, figure. So, so you see here a duration of unemployment. So that would mean that for, let's say, an unemployment duration of, let's say, less than 12 months, 
unemployment aid will consist of uh, payments from the European unemployment insurance of different levels, so that is to be discussed how large the transfer should be. On top of it, there can be a small fraction paid out of national uninsurance in, uh, uh, funds. After 12 months, payments from the European uninsurance system will stop and then only the national uh, so, uh, unemployment insurance will pay. And that guarantees actually also that governments have no incentive to, um, to, to, extend, uh, to, to um, postpone labor market reforms in the hope that they get more funding out of the European insurance um, mechanism. So what is now preferred, the direct transfer mechanism or the unemployment, uh, the European unemployment uh, system, so the indirect system? I think there is still a lot of there need for discussions, actually, what, what is better. But actually, we see that there are few advantages uh, of a European unemployment insurance compared to the direct transfer mechanisms. First is that um, unemployment is usually a very prompt measure of the business cycle. So immediately when a, an economy is uh, facing a downturn, unemployment increases and vice versa. Um, so, therefore, factors determining the transfers are set quickly and automatically. For, second, there's less scope for arbitrary political decisions. So, if you focus, for example, on uh, calculations of potential output or output gaps, uh, they are always um, connected to a lot of uncertainty about the calculation methodology and also getting the right GDP data is usually only available with a certain lag. Um, the second, uh, third argument is that aggregated demand is affected quickly since not governments receive the payment, as in the case of the direct transfer system, but uh, private households and even the constrained private households. So the unemployed households will receive these payments and therefore we can expect um, a larger effect on aggregated demand. <coughs> um, Another uh, advantage is that such a system could be introduced without imposing additional burden on labor market costs since new insurances would partly replace existing national systems. So it's not that this comes on top of labor market costs, but it's only kind of substitution. And uh, last but not least, bureaucratic burdens could be kept to a minimum by processing the European unemployment insurance via existing national security institutions, so we don't have to set up new administrative uh, bodies in the, in the, on the European level. Um, so what is important to stress is that uh, the, this international insurance mechanism or compensatory payment mechanism cannot replace sound economic and budget uh, uh, fiscal policy. The reason is that this mechanism will not be enough actually to, to, to synchronize the business cycles uh, in, in, in the European Monetary Union, so we also need national fiscal policy to actually be able to react counter-cyclical. Further, to minimize risk that a cyclical compensatory scheme changes the incentives for regional governments to protect their citizens against income fluctuations, one should also consider to uh, make the participation in that mechanism conditional on certain labor market reforms and uh, compliance with fiscal policy rules. So to conclude, um, I think we should seriously consider in the European Monetary Union to introduce such a European cyclical transfer mechanism because it actually can be an important instrument to facilitate the single monetary policy of the ECB and to enhance integration of uh, the European Monetary Union. <clears throat> the cyclical transfer system is not intended to redistribute tax revenues or debt burden across countries. This is important to stress actually to sell this mechanism to the citizens of all member states to make that clear. So one time country A is a donor and the country B's recipient, a few years later, it will be the other way around if it's a purely cyclical instrument. Um, 
fiscal discipline and sufficient level of competitiveness is therefore still important for the stability of the euro area because that mechanism cannot solve the um, actually the divergence completely of the European member states. And so, as I said already in the beginning, this mechanism is not an instrument to solve the current crisis in the euro area, but it should provide more stability to EMU in the medium and long run. So, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this conference and to give a presentation in uh, this conference on the subject of the current crisis. I think what I've heard and at the same time what I've read and heard in the course of the past week makes clear that we need more discussion across borders. This Wednesday, I gave a public lecture on the subject in Bonn, and most people asked me, isn't the ECB, quote unquote, defrauding us, taking away our savings? Yesterday, as I was coming here, I read a full page article by Hans Werner Sinn, which was saying exactly that and which was intended to influence the constitutional court decision in Karlsruhe, where my biggest worry is that the constitutional court in Karlsruhe might judge not about the compatibility of outright monetary transactions with the treaty, but about the compatibility with, of the treaty with the German constitution. And if the Karlsruhe court judges that the treaty is incompatible, with the German constitution that maybe needs to be renegotiated. I leave it to you to imagine what the implications for European capital markets and for financial systems in the periphery countries would be. I'm one of the people in Germany who uh, try to say things are not quite the way in which the court, Hans Werner Sinn, or some of the media present them, but it's actually quite difficult. And given the criticism of Angela Merkel that I heard over the past two days, and she's not my favorite by no means, I must say, if she'd followed what has been suggested, she would be out of power. So, once upon a time, there was a country that thought it was completely exploited by foreigners. The reparations burden of Versailles was impoverishing the Weimar Republic. I learned that in school. Nobody taught us that until 1930, borrowing from abroad brought in more money into Germany than Germany was paying in reparations. There's a booklet by Stephen Schuker at Boston University who's, which has the title American quote unquote reparations to Germany. There is an issue about perceptions. I'll not comment on the other uh, parts of the slide, just leave you to read them and want instead to talk about another experience. At some point in the early 90s, I went to an exhibition, We Construct a New City. This was about reconstruction in a West German city in the 50s. Two things struck me. One, how happy people were at the time about things that to us looked shabby. Secondly, how much the documents uh, shown conveyed a sense of the importance of doing things on one's own. 
At the time, I was involved in activities in East Germany, and of course, there was a complete contrast. In East Germany, they'd gotten lots of transfers from the West, but they were not doing things on their own, and that was the major burden uh, on them as far as I felt. So one thing that I've been wondering and that I think would have merited a little bit more attention in the discussions of this conference is suppose that in early 2010, the European institutions had said, Greece, you handle this on your own with the banks. The immediate impact would have been sharper because the net flow of money to the Greek government would have stopped. But there would have been more of a sense of doing things on one's own. I wouldn't have heard the troika over the past, the word troika over the past two days. And of course, the banks would have suffered. I think the latter part would have been much preferable. If we ask the question, why are we in such a muddle? It's because we haven't solved the banking problems. And when I talk about banking problems, I don't just mean the problems of Greek banks implicated by Greek sovereign debt, and as I learned yesterday also by a credit bubble of their own, or the problem of Spanish and Irish banks implicated by a real estate bubble. I also mean the problems of French and German banks that had been extremely weakly, weakly capitalized and not been cleaned up after the crisis. I think it's the complexity of these three types of crises interconnected through the Euro system that's made uh, for the muddle. I've seen that the title of one of the next presentations is Model Going On With Muddling Through. Uh, that's what we've been doing all along. So why are we observing this? And I think that's really the major issue for the future. We're dealing with the symbiosis of sovereigns and banks in a supranational monetary system. And many of the shocks that we're talking about are not shocks having to do with uh, something going wrong here or there in the macroeconomy, but it's shocks having to do with problems of governance and problems of uh, systematic effects that extend over, long run, or, or, over the longer run. It's the connection between supervision and politics and banks when it comes to government funding. It's the connection between supervision, politics, real estate and banks when it comes to dealing with local and national interests in particular in the real, real estate sector. And mind you, any of this, I could say about every country in the Eurozone, including my own. The German problem is a problem of public banks, the Landes Landesbanken, which are more captured than banks anywhere else that I know. So what difference does the Euro make? Well, if we ask ourselves, where do we want to go? What do we want? Any viable system of governance needs some element of discipline for people who borrow and for people who lend. And the euro has destroyed important elements of discipline. In particular, market discipline, two sets of market discipline. First, the exchange rate as an indicator of how monetary policy, how government policy is doing, how the economy is doing. Also, the exchange rate as an adjustment mechanism. I think in the past two days, the issue of the exchange rate as an adjustment mechanism 
has been overstressed because to the extent that borrowing is in foreign currency, devaluation is just going to give you a revaluation, an increase in the real value of debt. So anyone who's talking about deflation has to also talk about a cut of indebtedness. And in that respect, uh, I should say, and this goes back to what I was saying before about an alternative scenario for early 2010, I was very happy to see uh, Mr. Uh, Papa Dimitriou's uh, presentation uh, on what happens if we have a, a moratorium on payments, on, on, on debt service. I think something like that's going to come and will have to come anyway. But in any case, uh, when I talk about the exchange rate, exchange rates have provided a signal that alerted the media and alerted the domestic polity to whether things were going wrong in the, uh, in the economy, in particular with, with respect to uh, government. Another element of this is, of course, we no longer have uh, differences in I'm sorry. Another element of this is we have non-integrated goods markets, non-integrated markets for many services. That allows for different inflation rates. Differences in inflation rates when you have the same nominal rates of interest mean different real rates. And there you get into significant scope for bubbles. In the early 2000s, Germany was close to deflation. This was shown in the charts by uh, Kassin Bernot. With a relatively high real rate of interest, very little investment, and Germany has been the country with the the second lowest growth rate in the euro area for the past decade. Countries on the periphery with significant price increases had low real rates of interest and that fostered borrowing. What, what went wrong? Well, creditors were not imposing risk premium. We didn't have market discipline on the side of creditors as we thought that uh, there would be. Why not? I don't know. Were they myopic? Or were they expecting to be bailed out? Or were they expecting that they would have the power over governments to impose a bailout? Which, of course, to a large extent, they've managed to achieve. But it's the lack of budget discipline and the lack of market discipline which uh, really are key. Now that was supported by a lack of supervision. Typical example of the Bank of Spain in the mid 2000s wanted to check the uh, bank lending and real estate boom. And given the political connectedness of the local elites associated with the local building industry and the cajas, the central government said, you take your hands off that. So their governance of supervision did not really work. Where are we today? Well, we have an enormous amount of indebtedness. We have an enormous amount of still unresolved problems, non-performing loans, lots of skeletons in closets. Nobody wants to rock the boat. If nothing happens, muddling through will give us 20 years of J Japanese experience, except we are much less patient than the Japanese, and we are much more prone to, unfortunately, I have to use that word, fight each other. Underlying this is not just the notion that there is too much indebtedness, but also we have too much banking. One of the presentations yesterday mentioned that banking capacity in the euro area 
is about three or four times what it is in the US in relation to GDP. Some banks have to be cut where? That's a highly political question which gets us back to the issue of the relation between sovereigns and banks and the symbiosis between the two. So this is why we are embarking on banking union. And I think it's highly necessary, but I'm deeply pessimistic about how far it goes. In principle, yes, but in practice, the powers that be in the political systems in the different member states are doing a lot to prevent that from coming about. At the moment, the regulation that, gives the, that creates the single supervisory mechanism gives the ECB the power to apply all union law. In the case of directives, which are not applicable, it's supposed to apply the national laws that implement the directives. How is that going to work? 16 plus jurisdictions with different court systems, with different national laws, in a single supervisory mechanism? I don't see it. And then suppose that the ECB supervisor looks at a German bank which has lots of shipping loans and says, I don't like the shipping valuations in the books. And the German supervisor says, yes, I don't like them either, but do we really want to shut this bank down? And that one and that one? Without a resolution mechanism, it's not going to work. Forbearance is going to go on, and the Japanese strategy is, will continue to be followed. A resolution mechanism means money. Politicians always try to fool, fool us by saying the industry is going to pay for future bailouts by itself with a restructuring fund. In the case In the case of the S&Ls in the US, the restructuring fund or the deposit insurance fund paid 29 billion, the taxpayer 124 billion. You need a fiscal backstop. And the numbers for ESM are much too small. If you think that just Deutsche Bank has a balance sheet of more than two, tri two, tr two trillion, and that's just one bank, admittedly, one of the biggest, but there we are. So I think we need to move forward because the alternative is a breakup and a breakup is going to be accompanied by runs and extraordinary turbulence. In one talk earlier, there was a mention of how about creating an alternative currency at Rachma. I think the moment there is any notion that an alternative currency is going to be created and there will be an exit, anyone will run on the bank and ask the bank for this sort of thing which will not be subject to conversion. And the banks are not going to be able to support that here I come back to my introductory remarks. When I tell this to my German colleagues and ask them, what do you think the details of a dissolution would look like? I get a blank. But that's the sort of thing that we need to think about in terms of moving forward and doing institutional change. Ευχαριστώ και εγώ με τη σειρά μου για την πρόσκληση. Επειδή λόγω σύνθεσης στο ακροατήριο, στη συνεδρία την τελευταία είναι ένα είδος ελληνογερμανικού διαλόγου, γι' αυτό αποφάσισα να χρησιμοποιήσω την ουδέτερη γλώσσα της Αγγλικής για να έχω και απευθεία συνομιλία με, τους, με τα όλα τα μέλη του πάνελ. So I would like to go back to the question that was asked in the first panel, namely whether muddling through in the European Union is the way forward. 
And before talking about the future, let us take stock of what has happened. Remember that this is the worst crisis that Europe has experienced since 1929. It is also the worst crisis since the beginning of European unification. It began as an economic crisis and it soon developed with important political and social consequences. First point perhaps to make is that there are three main dimensions to the crisis. There is an international dimension because the crisis starts after the bursting of the biggest financial bubble. And that is international, that is not European. To be precise, it is not exactly international, it's something that affects the Western world, not directly China, India or Brazil. The second dimension is European, because in Europe we have decided to try to have a currency without a state, namely without the institutions and the policy instruments that are necessary to defend a currency in times of crisis. And the third dimension is national, because inside the European Union and the Eurozone in particular, we have individual countries that were in a deep economic mess before the financial crisis reached the European shores. And I can think of one or two close by. So what the crisis did was to reveal the serious economic weaknesses and political weaknesses of individual European countries when the bubble burst. So that's about the crisis. Now, the other point to make is that so far, five years down the road, we seem to have avoided the worst. Arguably the worst being the breakup of the Eurozone and the gradual disintegration of the European Union with unthinkable consequences in political, economic, or social terms. We have avoided the worst by doing a number of unthinkables, what were considered to be unthinkables, until 2009. Let me go through very quickly a list of unthinkables. One is bailout of individual European countries that were supposed to be banned by the Maastricht Treaty. The first restructuring of the Greek sovereign debt, another unthinkable. Massive interventions of the European Central Bank new forms of fiscal policy and general economic policy coordination that will take shared sovereignty in Europe into a new uncharted territory. A new financial mechanism for times of crisis that again was supposed not to be there because of the fear of moral hazard. So the list of unthinkables is long and many of them have already happened. But what are the main characteristics of all those unthinkables that have happened until now? They have always happened at the very last minute and only the absolutely minimum was done and that was never enough either in the political sphere or in the marketplace. Furthermore, another characteristic of the way we have handled the crisis so far is that the burden of adjustment has fallen mainly, if not exclusively, on the weaker, the debtor countries. But there is an interesting division of labor. The debtor countries have undertaken the main burden of adjustment, but the creditor countries have undertaken the credit risk if things go wrong in the end because they will not be paid back for the money they have given to the debtors. So, why have we done the absolute minimum and at the very last minute? For a number of reasons. First of all, because this is the way European institutions work. They are slow and they work on the basis of compromise and consensus and all this is a very slow moving operation. Even more importantly, because the overall cost of adjustment is simply huge and we cannot agree on who pays 
what part of the bill. Number three, because the economic crisis has led to more economic divergence inside the European Union. So with the way the crisis is experienced in Germany is very different from the way it is experienced in Ireland, in Portugal, in Spain, or Greece. An economic divergence combined with rising populism and nationalism in individual European countries makes common European solutions extremely difficult to reach. So, what is the price we have paid for this kind of muddling through, short-termism, whatever you like to call it? The price we have paid so far is that the cost of the adjustment has been much higher than anticipated, and the process of adjustment is taking much longer again than anticipated. Nobody in his or her right mind would have ever thought that adjustment, when the crisis emerged, was going to be slow or painless. Especially if you take a country like Greece. When you start in a country like Greece with more than 15% budget deficit as a percentage of GDP, with a public debt of almost 130% of GDP, and with a current account deficit of 15% of GDP, only if you believe in extraterrestrial economics, you will think that the adjustment is going to be painless or quick. But the adjustment has been much more painful, and it has lasted much longer, not only in Greece, but also in other European countries, because of the muddling through that been, has been the strategy in Europe so far. So where, we are, where are we today in Europe? We are, after many years of slow or zero growth, remember that in the best of scenarios, the average European country, I'm not talking about Greece, the Eurozone expects to reach living standards of 2007 in 2016. So we have already wasted a decade in terms of growth. Unemployment is average 12%, in the Eurozone, and in some countries has reached levels that would have been unthinkable, unimaginable for peacetime. Many banks in Europe remain undercapitalized. There are many zombie banks, in other words, still in Europe. And there's also a huge debt overhang, both private and public, in different European countries. So this is the situation. We usually describe it as the result of muddling through, you can call it short-termism, you can call it whatever you like. Is it likely to continue? I fear that the more likely scenario is yes. There's going to be more muddling through in the next few months or perhaps years ahead. What will muddling through, what form will muddling through take in the next few months, ideally for, those, for the muddlers? The first is that you may try to have a banking union, but with discounts. You will pretend that many of the problems of the banks are not there. You will not solve the legacy problem, the old problem, accumulated debts of individual banks. You will continue to pretend that much of private and even more so public debt in Europe is sustainable, which it is not and you will continue to wait for growth that comes like a tide to lift all boats, but the growth will not be coming. The consequences of this strategy will be that there will be very slow growth in Europe, that if there is slow growth, this is going to be very uneven. Much of the periphery will continue to languish with zero growth and very high rates of unemployment. And it is going to be also a divided Europe and an inward-looking Europe. The muddling through strategy will continue as long as there are, there is enough, there are enough people in individual European countries who believe, and perhaps rightly so, 
that the alternative is worse. Remember, this is interesting. And I'm not saying that it is strange that in the countries of the European periphery, which have suffered the most from adjustments following the bursting of the bubble and the European crisis, the large majority of people still believe that membership of the euro is a very important thing, which suggests that they are convinced that there is an alternative which is even worse than what they're living through today. And I think they're probably right. But this sort of muddling through strategy, continuing muddling through strategy, is very much prone to accidents. And accidents can take place either in the market through new speculative attacks because markets may not believe that this is a sustainable proposition, or they are also prone to accidents in the political sphere with political forces emerging in the most and the worst hit countries who actually challenge the existing strategy, the existing situation. And of course, you know very well that there is a lot of extremism rising, emerging in individual countries, and also much of anti-systemic parties. There is, of course, an alternative to muddling through. And the alternative to muddling through requires a kind of a new European grand bargain. A European grand bargain that may include a number of elements. One would be a greater macroeconomic flexibility, especially in the pace of fiscal consolidation in the worst hit countries, with more growth measures, coupled, and that is very important, with important structural reforms in the worst hit countries of the periphery. So the flexibility from the north has to be balanced with reform from the south. This could be ingredients of a grand bargain, which, of course, I don't have the time to go into detail here. And that is, I think, the crucial challenge facing Europe today. Will Europe rise to that challenge? I don't know. I think short of accidents, I would not be in a strange... This is actually a very strange situation because the, muddling, the continuation of the muddling through scenario paints a very bleak picture for the future. There is an alternative of a breakup which is even worse. It is disastrous. And the possibilities of a radical departure from the muddling through scenario are not particularly good given the present situation in Europe. And I will leave you at that. Κυρίε και κύριοι, ερχόμενο είχα την χαρά να ακούσω τον κύριο Παπαδημητρίου να αναπτύσσει τη δική του εισήγηση και τον άκουσα να λέει ότι ο όρο alternative currencies είναι ταμπού στη χώρα μα. Φοβάμαι ότι ταμπού είναι στη χώρα μας ακόμα και η συζήτηση γενικά για αναλλακτική πολιτική. Και η εμπειρία μου από τη Βουλή δυστυχώς είναι αυτή, ότι οι δυνάμεις που κυβερνούν τη χώρα και όσοι τους στηρίζουν, σχεδόν αν μπορούσαν θα απαγόρευαν κάθε συζήτηση για κάθε πολιτική πέρα από το μνημόνιο. Γι' αυτό νιώθω την ανάγκη όχι απλώς, να ευχαριστήσω όχι απλώς για την πρόσκληση να είμαι σήμερα εδώ, αλλά να ευχαριστήσω τους οργανωτές που είχαν την πρωτοβουλία αυτού του συνεδρίου, Πρώτον, διότι νομίζω ότι συμβάλλει στη διεθνοποίηση του ελληνικού προβλήματο και στην κατανοήση του ευρύτερα, αλλά και δεύτερον, διότι μα δίνει ιδέε και επιχειρήματα τα οποία μπορούν να μα βοηθήσουν στην χάραξη μια εναλλακτική πολιτική. Μόνο που νομίζω ότι τώρα πια δεν μα αρκεί μια εναλλακτική πολιτική. Η κατάσταση έχει γίνει τόσο σοβαρή, που νομίζω ότι πρέπει να σκεφτούμε του όρου ενό σχεδίου στρατηγικού, ενό master plan μετάβαση από τη λιτότητα στην ανασυγκρότηση ή για να χρησιμοποιήσω δύο γνωστούς όρους 
από την περιβόητη και θλιβερή δίθεν δημιουργική καταστροφή σε ένα πραγματικά δημιουργικό μετασχηματισμό της ελληνικής κοινωνίας. Θα προσπαθήσω να μοιράσω το χρόνο μου έτσι ώστε να απαντήσω τα ερωτήματα του κυρίου Παπαχελά, διότι τα βρίσκω πολύ περιεκτικά, μόνο που θα το κάνω σχεδόν τηλεγραφικά, διότι θα ήθελα λίγα λεπτά επίσης να κάνω κάποια σχόλια στις προτάσεις, στα σενάρια που μας παρουσίασε ο κ. Παπαδημητρίου. Το πρώτο λοιπόν ερώτημα αν το, είναι, αν το ευρώ είναι βιώσιμο. Ίσως πρέπει να, πούμε, να, μεταγλωτήσουμε, να μετασχηματίσουμε το ερώτημα υπό ποιε προϋποθέσεις το ευρώ είναι βιώσιμο. Με τη σημερινή πορεία των πραγμάτων δεν νομίζω ότι μπορούμε να, να πει κανεί, να εγγυηθεί κανεί. Ακούστηκε άλλωστε αρκετά ω τώρα να εγγυηθεί κανεί τη βιωσιμότητα του ευρώ. Με αυτή την πορεία αυτών των τεράστιων ανισορροπιών και ανισοτήτων που αναπτύσσονται εντό τη Ευρωζώνη και τα χάσματα που δημιουργούνται, το ευρώ μπορεί να αποσυντεθεί είτε από ένα ατύχημα όπω ελέγχθη, αλλά είτε και από πολιτική επιλογή. Υπάρχουν χώρε με βιομηχανική βάση και οι οποίε μπορεί κάποιε να επιλέξουν την έξοδό του από το ευρώ, ή υπάρχουν χώρε οι οποίε μπορεί να επιλέξουν σε τέτοια απόγνωση που να κάνουν ακόμα και επιλογέ, α είναι επιλογέ απόγνωση. Επομένω, αυτό που πραγματικά ενδιαφέρει είναι εκκινώντα από αυτή την κρίση να δούμε υπό ποιε συνθήκε και υπό ποιε προποθέσει, όχι απλώ να επιβιώσει το ευρώ, αλλά να επιστρέψουμε και σε αυτά που απαιτέλεσαν την αφετηρία της Ευρωπαϊκής Ενωποίησης και τα οποία κέρδισαν την εμπιστοσύνη των λαών για κάποιο διάστημα, αλλά σήμερα φοβούμε το όραμα κινδυνεύει να γίνει εφιάλτης. Συναφές, λοιπόν, με αυτό είναι το δεύτερο ερώτημα, μεταρρυθμίσεις και δημοκρατία. Νομίζω ότι τα πράγματα είναι αρκετά σαφή, ότι η κρίση στην Ευρώπη είναι εκτός των άλλων και μία κρίση νομοποίησης. Εάν δούμε τα στοιχεία του ευρωβαρόμετρου κλπ, η Ευρώπη και οι θεσμοί τη είναι σε τεράστια απόσταση από, την, από τους λαούς και τους πολίτες. Επομένως, και εδώ θα έλεγα το ερώτημα πρέπει να τεθεί ποιες μεταρρυθμίσεις μπορούν να ενισχύσουν τη δημοκρατία, ποιες μεταρρυθμίσεις μπορούν να καλύψουν το περιβόητο δημοκρατικό έλλειμμα που δυστυχώ διαβρύνεται και άρα ποιε αλλαγέ και ποιε μεταρρυθμίσεις μπορούν να αποτρέψουν την περαιτέρω απονομοποίηση της ευρωπαϊκής πορείας. Και θα αναφερθώ λίγο πιο συγκεκριμένα σε αυτά, αξιοποιώντας το τρίτο ερώτημα, το οποίο ρωτάει αν η Γερμανία μπορεί να παίξει πούμε, το ρόλο του, 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 της ατομομηχανίας ε, για την έξοδο από την κρίση. Θα έλεγα ε, ότι κάθε εκδοχή της Ευρώπης στη δική μου αντίληψη, το ειδικό βάρος της Γερμανίας θα είναι σημαντικό. Δηλαδή, αυτό που ακούγεται για γερμανική Ευρώπη, ε, έχει αρκετή αλήθεια μέσα του, αλλά νομίζω ότι το θέμα δεν είναι η χώρα, αλλά οι ιδέες πάνω στις οποίες η χώρα ή οι χώρες κινούνται. Θέλω να πω δηλαδή ότι προσωπικά θα διέκρινα εδώ τρεις εκδοχές της Ευρώπης. Η μία είναι η εκδοχή της Ευρώπης που ζούμε, που είναι η Ευρώπη της κρίσης και της αποδιάρθρωσης, η οποία είναι το αποτέλεσμα μιας social φιλελεύθερης συνένεσης, ας μην το ξεχνούμε αυτό. Στηρίζεται όχι απλώς στις αρχές της αγοράς, αλλά εδραιώθηκε σε μια φάση αλαζονίας του κεφαλαίου, όπου πίστευαν ότι ούτε κρίσεις μπορούν να υπάρξουν, ούτε χρεοκοπίες μπορούν να υπάρξουν και είναι εντυπωσιακή η απουσία ακριβώς της πρόνοιας, ακόμα και αυτών των ενδεχόμενων στα αρχικά κείμενα της συνθήκης του Μάστρικτ και της όλης αρχιτεκτονικής του Ευρώπη. Με αυτή την Ευρώπη, ούτε το, με αυτή την εκδοχή της Ευρώπης, ούτε το ευρώ θα είναι, είναι βιώσιμο, ούτε πρόκειται ποτέ να αποκτήσει αυτή η Ευρώπη κάποιο λαϊκό κοινωνικό ερίσμα. Το μέλλον της είναι να γίνει μια αυταρχική, μισητή, ένα αυταρχικό μισητό προς τους λαούς οικοδόμημα. Η δεύτερη εκδοχή της Ευρώπης είναι μια Ευρώπη που βεβαίως οικοδομείται στη βάση των αγορών και της ελευθερίας κίνησης του κεφαλαίων, αλλά φροντίζει να έχει μηχανισμούς εκ Exposed, εκ των υστέρων έστω, άμβλησης ή και αντιμετώπισης των ανισορροπιών. Είναι αυτό που ορισμένοι αποκαλούμε κάποια έτσι ε, ποιητική αδεία, θα έλεγα, και η Ευρώπη. Ε, εδώ μπορούμε να δούμε ακριβώς 
ότι μια τέτοια Ευρώπη που θα διαθέτει ένα transfer union, θα είναι transfer union, θα, θα διαθέτει δηλαδή μηχανισμούς ο, μεταφοράς πόρων, θα έχει ένα ισχυρό προϋπολογισμό, θα εγγυάται πανευρωπαϊκά τις καταθέσεις, θα έχει ένα clearing union, δηλαδή θα ανακυκλώνεται τα πλεονάσματα, θα υποχρεώνονται οι χώρες με πλεονάσματα να ανα, ανα, ανακυκλώνουν ο, προς ε, ενίσχυση της συνολικής ανάπτυξη και της ε, κάλυψη των χασμάτων, μια ιδέα που άλλωστε ο Κέινς είχε χρησιμοποιήσει μετά τον πόλεμο. Μια τέτοια Ευρώπη, λοιπόν, θα μπορούσε να έχει ένα μέλλον, τουλάχιστον στο μέσο μακροπόθεσμο ορίζοντα. Εμείς ως αριστερά με αυτή την Ευρώπη συζητούμε, με αυτές τις ιδέες είμαστε σε διάλογο. Τις αξιοποιούμε στο δικό μας σχεδιασμό, αν και σημειώνουμε ένα, δύο ελλείμματα. Το πρώτο είναι ότι ορισμένε από τι αιτίε παραμένουν ανέπαφε. Δηλαδή, εφόσον έχουμε την ελεύθερη κίνηση κεφαλαίων, πάντα θα υπάρχει ο κίνδυνο για φούσκε στη μία πλευρά και, στην, και, στην, και ύφεση στην άλλη. Και αυτοί οι μηχανισμοί, βεβαίω, που προανέφερα, μπορούν να αμβλύνουν, να συγκρατούν αυτέ τι αντιθέσει, αλλά δεν θα πάβει να υπάρχει πάντα η αιτία. Και η δεύτερη δυσκολία που έχουν αυτέ οι ιδέε επί του παρόντο είναι ότι δεν έχουν κοινωνικά και πολιτικά υποκείμενα να τι υλοποιήσουν. Δηλαδή, δεν, ε, αν δούμε τι λένε τα σοσιαλιστικά ή σοδημοκρατικά κόμματα στην Ευρώπη, ψελίζουν κάτι από αυτά. Δεν υιοθετούν ουσιαστικά τίποτα το συγκεκριμένο που θα οδηγούσε σε μια άλλη εκδοχή της Ευρώπης. Μου θυμίζει λίγο αυτό που ζούμε, την ιδέα που είχε διατυπώσει ο Κέινς μετά τον Πρώτο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο, για την διαγραφή των χρεών σε όλη την Ευρώπη, ως προϋπόθεση για την ειρήνη της Ευρώπης, το 1919. Πολλές φορές έχω σκεφτεί, αν η ιδέα αυτή ελοποιεί το, σω θα είχαμε αποφύγει και το φασισμό και το δεύτερο παγκόσμιο πόλεμο, αλλά δεν υλοποιήθηκε διότι δεν υπήρχαν κοινωνικά και πολιτικά υποκείμενα να τι να, να, να υιοθετήσουν και να αγωνιστούν για αυτέ τι ιδέε. Άρα, το λέω αυτό για να ενισχύσω την άποψη που ήδη είπα. Μια τρίτη εκδοχή τη Ευρώπη, α μου επιτραπεί να την πω, αριστερή εκδοχή τη Ευρώπη, ακριβώ θέλει να συνδέσει προοδευτικέ ιδέε με κοινωνικά κινήματα ω το μόνο τρόπο για να υλοποιηθούν. Σε ό,τι αφορά τώρα το. Επομένω, ναι, μια Γερμανία που θα μπορούσε να ε, έχει αυτέ τι ιδέε θα μπορούσε να παίξει με το μέγεθό τη καθοριστικό ρόλο, αλλά μια τέτοια, σε μια τέτοια εκδοχή η Γερμανία πιστεύω δεν θα δρούσε ε, εθνικιστικά, αλλά θα δρούσε ακριβώ ω μέρο ενό ε, μια συλλογική και μια αλληλέγγυα Ευρώπη. Κάτι το οποίο σήμερα δεν το έχουμε δυστυχώ και για την ίδια τη Γερμανία. Σε ό,τι αφορά τη ΣΥΠΑ. Προφανώς υπάρχουν θετικές και αρνητικές όμως ο, πρακτικές στις ΗΠΑ. Ε, είχα μιλήσει κάποτε με ένα γερουσιαστή Αμερικανό και μου είπαν τη γράψτε από εμάς ό,τι θέλετε εκτός από τον τρόπο που λειτουργεί και χρηματοδοτεί το πολιτικό μας σύστημα και εκτός από τον τρόπο που διανέμεται το εισόδημα στην Αμερική ενώντας τις μεγάλες ανισότητες. Οπωσδήποτε όμως το γεγονό είναι ότι οι ΗΠΑ απέφυγαν την... Απέ, ε, Ξεπέρασαν την ύφεση έστω και προσωρινά, έστω και με σχετικά υψηλή ενεργεία. Παρεμβήκανε πολύ γρήγορα στι τράπεζέ του και όμω εγώ καταλήγω στο εξή. Η Ευρώπη πρέπει να δημιουργήσει το δικό τη μοντέλο. Μία Ευρώπη που απλώ αντιγράφει έστω και θετικέ πρακτικέ, δεν νομίζω ότι μπορεί να εμπνεύσει του λαού. Α θυμίσω και πάλι εδώ, αξιοποιώντα τον τίτλο αυτή του κύκλου τη συζήτηση, α θυμίσω λοιπόν εδώ ότι η Ευρώπη δημιουργήθηκε ακριβώ με τη φιλοδοξία να αποτελέσει ένα νέο παγκόσμιο παράδειγμα και όχι να αντιγράψει κάτι άλλο. Θα ήθελα τώρα δύο λόγια να πω για την δική μας πιο συγκεκριμένη περίπτωση. Εγώ νιώθω την ανάγκη να υποστηρίξω ότι χρειαζόμαστε, χρειαζόμαστε ένα είδος αποτύπωσης της κατάστασης. Δηλαδή, πού βρισκόμαστε ακριβώ. Αν ο όρος απογραφή δεν ήταν τόσο βεβαρημένος, θα έλεγα ότι χρειαζόμαστε μια απογραφή, κοινωνική απογραφή πριν από όλα. Δεν ξέρουμε πώ είναι οι άνεργοι ακριβώ. Δεν ξέρουμε πώ είναι οι πεινασμένοι ακριβώ. Δεν ξέρουμε πώ είναι οι άστεγοι ακριβώ. Δεν ξέρουμε πόσα παιδιά εργάζονται ανασφάλιστα. Δεν ξέρουμε βασικά μεγέθη τη κοινωνία μα. Ενώ δεν τα ξέρουμε με όρου, κατανοείτε τι θέλω να πω, στατιστικού, επιστημονικού. Επίση, θα ήθελα να, να, να προσθέσω επίση κάτι το οποίο θα έπρεπε να το γνωρίζουμε, αλλά καμιά φορά ξεχνιέται. Και τα λέω αυτά διότι θέλω να υποστηρίξω την άποψη ότι όλα όσα μα είπε ο κ. Παπαδημητρίου, εγώ τα θεωρώ αθρηστικά ότι μα χρειάζονται. Αθρηστικά, όχι αναλλακτικά. Ε, σα θυμίζω λοιπόν ότι το ελληνικό χρέο, με τον τρόπο που, συγκρο... που, που συσσωρεύτηκε, ε, είναι ένα χρέο το οποίο δεν επενδύθηκε αναπτυξιακά. 
Δηλαδή, αν δείτε του αριθμού, δεν θα σα κουράσω, αλλά θέλω ένα έτο για παράδειγμα, που είναι όμω κοινό, είναι, ε, είναι ενδεικτικό. Το, το 2008, το ελληνικό κράτο δανείστηκε 39 δισεκατομμύρια. Πού πήγαν αυτά τα 39, 26 ήταν χρεολύσια παλιών χρεών, 11 ήταν τόκοι παλιού χρέου, 2,5 ήταν εξοπλιστικά προγράμματα. Ούτε ένα ευρώ δεν πήγε στο κοινωνικό κράτο, ούτε ένα ευρώ δεν πήγε σε μισθού, ούτε ένα ευρώ δεν πήγε σε επενδύσει. Άρα αυτό το χρέο δεν μπορεί να πληρωθεί παρά μόνο αν έχουμε νέα ανάπτυξη. Είναι ε, από αυτή την άποψη εγκληματικό αυτό το οποίο έγινε ε, το 2010, όπου αν, αντί να αρχίσουμε μια ρύθμιση του χρέους, ε, μπήκαμε σε μια λογική ύφεση και λιτότητας. Σε ό,τι αφορά λοιπόν τα συγκεκριμένα τώρα σενάρια τα οποία ακούστηκαν από τον κύριο Παπαδημίου, θα ήθελα να πω τα εξή σύντομα σχόλια. Marshall Plan, το κλειδί είναι στην τελευταία του φράση, πολιτική βόληση. Δυστυχώ δεν υπάρχει. Ήμουν προημερών στην Ευρώπη, στην Βρυξέλλες, σε μια συζήτηση. Το μόνο που έχουμε συγκεκριμένο είναι υπό τον τίτλο Marshall Plan. Ο όρος για μας είναι και λίγο προβληματικός να τον χρησιμοποιούμε. Αλλά, εν πάση περιπτώσει, ε, το μόνο που έχουμε συγκεκριμένο είναι μια πρόταση των γερμανικών συνδικάτων. Είναι πολύ ισχυνή, είναι πολύ αβέβαιη όπως η χρηματοδότησή τη και, εν πάση περιπτώσει, δεν είναι Marshall Plan, διότι δεν προβλέπει τίποτα για το χρέο. Και επίση, μια πρόταση που αφορά όλη την Ευρώπη. Θα είναι χρήσιμο να υλοποιηθεί, αλλά δεν απαντάει στο ειδικό πρόβλημα του Ευρωπαϊκού Νότου ή το πρόβλημα τη Ελλάδα. Μορατόριουμ. Νομίζω εγώ το μορατόριουμ χρειάζεται σε όλε τι εκδοχέ για το λόγο που είπα. Δηλαδή, δεν μπορεί μια οικονομία σαν την ελληνική, στη φάση που είναι σε ύφεση ή σε ισχνή και αβέβαιη ανάκαμψη, δεν μπορεί να πληρώνει ούτε ένα ευρώ, ούτε για τόκους, ούτε για χρεολύσια. Αντίθετα, έχει ανάγκη μιας εξωτερικής χρηματοδοτικής όθηση. Και ακριβώς γι' αυτό, νομίζω σωστά ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ, ούτε ή άλλως το έχει στο πρόγραμμά του αυτό το στοιχείο. Ε, εναλλακτικά μέσα πληρωμής. Νομίζω και εδώ πρέπει να ανοίξουμε τη βεντάλια, Πέρα δηλαδή από το ένα εναλλακτικό μέσο πληρωμή που θα μπορούσε να λειτουργήσει και ω εναλλακτικό νόμισμα εντό εισαγωγικών, νομίζω πρέπει να σκεφτούμε εναλλακτικά μέσα πληρωμή γενικότερα, εναλλακτικά ομόλογα ειδικού σκοπού, ποικίλα χρηματοπιστωτικά εργαλεία με τα οποία μπορούμε να δημιουργήσουμε συ, συ, ε, ρευστότητα. Διαφορετικά υπάρχει κίνδυνο αυτή η ασφιξία να πάρει ακόμα μεγαλύτερε διαστάσει και εγώ δεν είμαι καθόλου βέβαιο για τι προβλέψει ότι η ύφεση τέλειωσε. Μακάρι να τελειώσει, αλλά δεν μπορούμε να είμαστε καθόλου βέβαια γι' αυτά. Άρα αυτό που θα ήθελα να ενθαρρύνω είναι μια ευρύτερη ανείχνευση τρόπων, μεθόδων, εργαλείων και μέσων με τα οποία μπορούμε να διευρύνουμε τις δυνατότητες ρευστότητας και χρηματοδότητας της οικονομίας. Προσθέτω πάντως αυτά τα τρία και ένα τέταρτο. Νομίζω θα χρειαστούμε και κάποιες εξαιρέσει. Δηλαδή, δεν, ε, δεν είναι βέβαιο ότι μπορεί η Ελλάδα ακόμα και με ενισχύσει που δεν υπάρχουν αλλά μιλάμε θεωρητικά, μέσα στο διαμορφωμένο θεσμικό κανονισκό πλαίσιο της Ευρωζώνης να μπορέσει να βγει από την κρίση με τρόπο με όρους δικαιοσύνης και βιωσιμότητες. Θα πρέπει, επομένω να δούμε ότι η ελληνική περίπτωση, χωρίς να είναι μια εθνική ιδιαιτερότητα, όπως είπανε, με την έννοια ότι βεβαίως έχουμε ενδογενείς αιτίε της κρίσης, αλλά είναι και μέρος της πανευρωπαϊκής κρίσης, εν τούτης, όμως η Ελλάδα είναι η χώρα και η περίπτωση η οποία ανέδειξε πρώτη τα ελλείμματα της αρχιτεκτονικής του ευρώ, το 2009 και το 2010. Ίσως ζούμε και τώρα το ίδιο. Δηλαδή, η Ελλάδα και πάλι, αν και η κατάσταση και σε άλλες χώρες, όπως την Πορτογαλία, δεν είναι πολύ καλύτερη, αλλά, εν πάση περιπτώσει, η Ελλάδα σήμερα αποτελεί μια περίπτωση που δεν μπορεί να ενταχθεί σε κάποια από τα κανονιστικά πλαίσια της Ευρώπης. Δεν έχουμε υπερβάλλον έλλειμμα μόνο, δεν έχουμε πρόβλημα, δεν έχουμε πρόβλημα αυτό απλώς μακροοικονομικών ανισορροπιών, για να μπούμε στον κανονισμό 472. Είμαστε μία περίπτωση που έχουμε ανθρωπιστική κρίση, οξύτατη, και είμαστε μια χώρα στην οποία έχει καταστραφεί παραγωγικό κεφάλαιο, πάγιο κεφάλαιο. Επομένως, είμαστε μια περίπτωση που απαιτεί ειδικά μέτρα και εφόσον αυτά τα ειδικά μέτρα θα χρειαστούν και για άλλες χώρες, ίσως θα πρέπει, επομένως, να θέσουμε το θέμα, θέτοντας το θέμα μάλλον από το μνημόνιο μετά το μνημόνιο τι, η απάντηση πρέπει να είναι ένα ολοκληρωμένο σχέδιο ανασυγκρότησης και μετασχηματισμού της κοινωνίας μέσα σε ένα νέο θεσμικό πλαίσιο της Ευρώπης, το οποίο θα πρέπει να διεκδικήσουμε και εμείς και μαζί και με άλλους λαούς. Σας ευχαριστώ. Έχουμε λίγο χρόνο για, για ερωτήσεις. Παρακαλώ. Ε, 
Έχετε το μικρόφωνο, αν θέλετε, αρχίστε για να μην χάνουμε χρόνο. Having accepted the invitation on the part of the LIB Institute, uh, very gracious on, on the part of both of you. Um, a question that, that either one of you could, could potentially answer. I think we all recognize, um, especially after the proceedings of this two-day conference, that the Eurozone is in trouble. Whether we're talking about the debt crisis, the banking crisis, the imbalance crisis, the Eurozone is in trouble. Many of us, uh, including myself, have launched perhaps an unfair uh, attack against Germany for the sort of policies that it has imposed on the economically beleaguered nations. But I think it's a fact, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the economic situation or the economy of Germany is not in the sort of shape that the rest of Europe believes it is. Far worse. Well, okay. It is not uh, a growing economy. It if we can facing... get to the question because we have well, very little the question, time. The question is, if the German economy itself is facing problems with regard to growth, unemployment, lack of investments, why is it so resistant in taking the next step towards some sort of a federal European state? We are all in the same boat. Are we going to sink together? I could I could try to answer your question uh, briefly because we have only a few minutes left. So I totally agree that it only seems that Germany is in such a, a very good economic state. Um, basically, Germany is, has a lack of investment. There's a huge investment gap collected the last 12 years. Um, um, so I completely agree. But I think the reason why Germany is still opposing any um, proposals to achieve a um, better integration of uh, the European Monetary Union is that we're in the midst of a, of a crisis. And I think then it's always very difficult to implement uh, these uh, proposals because then you always have a mix between um, or that there's the risk that you impose uh, um, policy measures that are now facing uh, the crisis and that you implement them permanently. And I think that's uh, where, why there is so much resistance. But I think what also plays a big role is what also Martin Helbig stressed in his uh, presentation. There is a f somehow a resistance to, to really tackle the banking problem. And I think uh, because if you, if you really consider what has to be done, all, all streets always come and end actually in, in, in exactly the problem that we have to start the banking union. We have to actually find a way for, uh, um, to, to implement a um, European banking resolution scheme. And I think this is really the largest hurdle that we have to take. And then all other problems, further integration of the European countries, and more fiscal integration is possible. But, but maybe Martin Helwig wants to answer any uh, The issue of a lack of investment and lacking growth is, of course, quite old in Germany. Uh, some of the reasons have to do with well, uh, Germany being a capital-rich country and capital being exported. Why the resistance against a bigger federal system One is a fear of having the government get into debt in an uncontrollable way. This is one of the sort of uh, issues on which German politics has been founded from historical reasons. Another is 
the political process is, and also economic process, is very much busy with its own agendas. I, have a, I suspect that this year, in this year, uh, more ink is being spent on the uh, revolution in energy uh, provision than on any other topic of uh, economic policy. And of course, the dimensions of that are huge. Uh, a third issue, there was strong resistance in the population against the creation of the euro. And there was a strong sense in the population, and I mean, this is what makes the success of people like uh, Hans Werner Zinn in this debate. Uh, th th there is a strong sense that promises were not kept, such as the ECB will be like the Bundesbank. I go out and when I lecture on this or I write newspaper articles on this, I said it's paradoxical to say the institution is independent then to also say it must do whatever a good uh, conservative German economist uh, wants it to do or what the Bundesbank wants it to do. The two, two don't go together and I, my own view is that the ECB has so far used its independence fairly wisely. I absolutely do not share uh, this reaction of my compatriots but that's a political fact and the move beyond, I think you were using the word unthinkable, the move beyond the no bailout clause of the Maastricht Treaty has the same kind of emotional uh, status. Uh, it's very difficult for politicians to say we really want to go beyond that. I think that's actually a major failing of uh, the government, in particular of Mrs. Merkel. Mrs. There are lots of criticisms of her that I would not share, but I think uh, one that needs to be made is that she has not explained to uh, the people in Germany why all this is necessary and why all this needs to, to, to move forward. Uh, if she had, she might have lost the election. But then uh, Mr. Schroeder, 10 years ago, had his program and tried to explain it. He lost the election, but his record will stand in history. Um, Pablo Seleferre at Oxford University. Um, my question is for Professor Helwig. Um, would you say that the, um, the bailout, the way it was constructed, uh, addressing the problems of the banking system in the Eurozone, so the failures of, as you said, the market discipline and so on, could be um, uh, described as a transfer from Greece to Germany? Thank you. I don't see that in the sense that... Uh, I mean, I was using the example of Germany in the 20s. Net cash flows went one direction. And as for the sums that are in the books, it remains to be seen what those mean. My own anticipation is that at some point or other, they will be very much written down. So in term, if, if, if we look at the actual cash flows, what's the direction in which money flows? I think it was a bailout from Northern European taxpayers to Northern European banks. I'm Josef Gilles from uh, the University of Edinburgh. Uh, first a question for Professor Bernard. I'm not sure that I understand why you say that your scheme is not a fiscal transfer. And as a matter of fact, I'm not, I do not understand why it's superior to proposals from the Bruegel Institute, a, 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 let's say a Bruegel Plus, where you leave legacy debt to where it belongs, and then you mutualize debt up to 60% of GDP in accordance with Maastricht Treaty criteria. Um, obviously, if you have a good cycle, you will be borrowing less. 
And if you have a bad cycle, you will be borrowing more. So uh, uh, what's the difference? What's the big deal with fiscal transfers? All monetary unions are all about fiscal transfers. And a, a question for Professor Helwig. Um, do you think the European stability mechanism will ever uh, work properly, especially since its architecture is too clever by half? And that's a negative expression, as a matter of fact, in English. Um, average losses, 20%. So if you take 8% from liabilities and you convert them into assets, you have already written off 16%, plus 4%, um, the national contribution, that's 20%. How much the SM is going to pay? It's anybody's guess. Thank you. Let's take two more questions, and then you respond to all of them at the, at the end. So we have time. My name is George Zestos. I'm a professor of economics. I'm a professor of uh, European integration. And I want to congratulate the speakers and the moderator for the great job, every one of you. Uh, and what you're doing is in the right direction. And uh, it is obvious to me going through this uh, two-day seminar that the solution comes to a compromise solution that everybody needs to compromise. Otherwise, there is no other way. And the, the German speakers, they show that, and uh, the Greek speakers, they show that. And uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, if there is another way. For example, the word transfer payments cannot be used because it's a big no-no in Germany. The word, bay, the word, the word uh, Marshall Plan cannot be used. Um, at the other time, we need democracy, and we need participation of the people. Uh, so much. Thank you. My name is uh, Georgios Thomaidis, and I am a resident psychiatrist uh, who works in Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, my question will be posed especially to Mr. Dragasakis, but it is open for everybody in the panel also. Mr. Dragasakis referred to the lack of political will in the European and Greek institutions in order, in order to to try to find and, in a way, to use practically a solution for the problems of uh, the European and Greek economy. And uh, Mr. Dragasakis said that in Greece we do not know who is doing what and why. There are too many scientists in Greece who do impressive job in uh, the sectors of uh, understanding and solving the problems that you referred. I'm talking about innovative scientists or theoretical scientists who create models, and models who work or can be applied in Greece, for example. Which are, do you think, the obstacles for a leading party member like you to take an initiative in order to find these people and to organize them in working groups that could provide and the proposals and the plans that could be used for the restoration of Greek economy and society. Okay, thank you. Let's start the responses from the left. I can actually answer very quickly. Uh, I totally agree with, your, uh, with you that it's a fiscal transfer. I only said it's, we shouldn't call it transfer because people get mad about it because they are panicking. They only hear transfer and they have in mind it's a permanent transfer in one direction. And that's why I said we could, should call it insurance system to make clear that it's, it's a, it's a two-way uh, transfer. So it's only the word. I'm afraid that acoustically I just did not understand the question, but uh, if you ask me whether anything works right now, my answer is, as things are, none of them is going to be satisfactory and everything will have to be muddled along further. Uh, on the point of a grand bargain, moving forward to European sovereignty. I think the key issue is going to be to what extent that's possible without increasing even more the sense 
among the population that decisions are taking away, taken away from the national level or the local level and are being taken by the elites in Brussels. Uh, any grand bargain, you were saying, it has to involve some disciplining element, and some disciplining element was also inherent in the oversight argument uh, of Mr. Papadimitriou. And the problem about the, these disciplining elements is that it's very easy for them to lose political le legitimacy if ever they acquire them. And um, it's important to move to a situation where uh, the people who are concerned don't always have the sense that someone else is taking the decisions for them. And that's where I see the real conflict about moving forward to more Europe. Στο πρώτο ερώτημα, αν κατάλαβα καλά, έχει να κάνει με αυτό που είπα ότι δεν βλέπω στην Ευρώπη αυτή τη στιγμή να υπάρχει πολιτική βούληση για ένα Marshall Plan, όπως μας το περιέγραψε ο κύριος Παπαδημητρίου. Υπάρχουν όμως στην Ευρώπη, για να μην αδικήσω εντελώς την κατάσταση, υπάρχουν κινήσεις, πρωτοβουλίες και συζητήσεις. Αυτό που είπα για τα γερμανικά συνδικάτα μπορεί να μην είναι αυτό που θα θέλαμε, είναι όμως μια ενδιαφέρουσα πρωτοβουλία και αρκετά επιστημονικά α, α, think tanks και άλλα αναγνωρίζουν την ανάγκη και διατυπώνουν προτάσεις προς την κατεύθυνση αυτή που συζητάμε. Όμως, αυτό δεν, πάβει να, δεν πρέπει να μας κρύψει ότι υπάρχει πρόβλημα στην Ευρώπη. Υπάρχει ίσως ένα φαινόμενο, θα το έλεγα, φαύλος κύκλος. Δηλαδή, επειδή η Ευρώπη, οι θεσμοί τη έγιναν ερήμην των λαών, οι λαοί δεν αναγνωρίζουν σε αυτού τις δικές τους ανάγκες. Επομένως, η Ευρώπη δεν εμπνέει. Οι λαοί δεν στηρίζουν επιλογές ευρωπαϊκές, προτιμούν εθνικές άμεσες λύσεις και αυτό αναπαράγεται και διωγκώνται και δημιουργεί αυτή την κρίση, αυτό το κρίση νομοποίηση που είπα. Η απάντηση λοιπόν σε αυτό είναι μια γενικότερη μεταβολή, η οποία έχει να κάνει με το πώς οι ίδιες κοινωνίες ενεργοποιούνται, πώς αναπτύσσονται κοινωνικά κινήματα τα οποία εκφράζουν ανάγκες των πολιτών και πώς επομένως μέσα από αυτή τη διαδικασία θα καταδειχθεί ότι στα περισσότερα προβλήματα οι λύσει πρέπει να είναι πανευρωπαϊκέ. Καμιά χώρα μόνη τη δεν μπορεί να αντιμετωπίσει το πρόβλημα του περιβάλλοντο χωρί συνεργασία. Καμιά χώρα μόνη τη μπορεί να αντιμετωπίσει φορολογικού παραδείσους και φοροδιαφυγή, αν δεν υπάρχει φορολογική συνεργασία. Καμιά χώρα της δεν μπορεί να αντιμετωπίσει πολλά άλλα προβλήματα για να μην επεκτείνουμε. Άρα η σύντομη απάντηση είναι ότι στου θεσμού αντανακλούνται συσχετισμοί δύναμη που διαμορφώνονται στην κοινωνία και άρα την κρίση. Τη Ευρώπη πρέπει να τη δούμε και ω ένα πρόβλημα συσχετισμών, οι οποίοι πρέπει να αλλάξουν προ προοδευτική κατεύθυνση. Στο δεύτερο τώρα ερώτημα, που έχει να κάνει με το πώ ο, ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ, α, τι εμποδίζει το ΣΥΡΙΖΑ να βρει επιστήμονε οι οποίοι σκέφτονται ή μελετούν διάφορα θέματα. Πρώτον, αυτό που είπα είχε να κάνει με φαινόμενα που τα ζούμε, αλλά το δικό μα κράτο ποτέ δεν είχε σε επάρκεια μία δυνατότητα να αποτυπώνει την κοινωνική πραγματικότητα. Α, αυτό, σε αυτό αναφερόμουν, ότι ξέρουμε ότι έχουμε οικογένειες χωρίς εισόδημα και χωρίς δουλειά. Ξέρουμε ότι έχουμε άστεγους, ξέρουμε ότι έχουμε αυτά τα προβλήματα. Δεν υπάρχει μια τέτοια κοινωνική αποτύπωση και ένας δημόσιος διάλογος γύρω από αυτά τα προβλήματα που να μας βοηθάει και στην συγκεκριμένη πολιτική, το σχεδιασμό της συγκεκριμένης πολιτικής αντιμετώπισης. Τώρα, ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ τι κάνει. Ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ Έχουμε αναπτύξει μία μεθοδολογία, στο πω έτσι, επειδή, όπως γνωρίζετε, ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ δεν ήταν κόμμα, τώρα γίνεται νέο κόμμα, και επίσης, επί 30 χρόνια είχαμε μάθει πώς να διατυπώνουμε αιτήματα προς τις κυβερνήσεις. Τώρα α, πρέπει να μάθουμε να διατυπώνουμε πολιτικές που ενδεχομένως εμείς ήδη θα εφαρμόσουμε. Έχουμε, λοιπόν, ένα σύστημα που αρχίζουμε από τη μελέτη των προβλημάτων, όταν διαμορφώνεται μια θέση, γίνεται θέση του κόμματο και αυτή μετά την κάνουμε δημόσια διαβούλευση. Το κρίσιμο θέμα ποιο είναι, ότι τα κόμματα πρέπει να συμπυκτώνουν αυτό που γίνεται μέσα στην κοινωνία. Δηλαδή, αν η ίδια η κοινωνία παράγει ιδέε και τα κόμματα είναι ακόμα που θέλει, μπορεί αυτέ οι ιδέε να τι κάνει πολιτική και πρόγραμμα. Άρα, εγώ θα ήθελα να ενθαρρύνω πρωτοβουλίε πολιτών, ομάδε πολιτών, με οποιοδήποτε τρόπο, 
και έχουμε θετικέ πρωτοβουλίε σε αυτόν τον τομέα, με δομέ αλληλεγγύη που δημιουργούνται σε θελοντική βάση κλπ. Να αναπτύσσονται και ιδέε και πολιτικέ προτάσει ακόμα για την αντιμετώπιση διαφόρων προβλημάτων. Και πιστεύω ότι ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ θα σα βρει όπου και αν βρίσκεστε. Αν δεν μα βρείτε εσεί. Λοιπόν, καταλήγοντα, εγώ θα να κάνω δύο σχόλια. Το πρώτο. Το πρώτο σχόλιο είναι ότι συμφωνώ με τον κ. Δραγασάκη ότι είναι πολύ μεγάλο λάθο να γίνονται συζητήσει με ταμπού στην Ελλάδα και αυτό δυστυχώ το έχουμε εγκλωβιστεί και φταίμε πολύ και εμεί, βέβαια, οι δημοσιογράφοι σε αυτό. Και νομίζω ότι είναι καιρό η συζήτηση να γίνεται πολύ πιο ανοιχτή και πολύ πιο ειλικρινή. Αλλά θεωρώ, βέβαια, και τη συνέντευξη και αυτό είναι πολύ σημαντικό για να καταλαβαίνουμε και πώ σκέφτονται και οι υπόλοιποι στην Ευρώπη, διότι πολλέ φορέ εμεί ζούμε σε ένα δικό μα ονειρικό κόσμο. Και το δεύτερο, η δεύτερη παρατήρηση που θα έκανα είναι ότι η δικιά μου τουλάχιστον. Το δικό μου συμπέρασμα είναι ότι η Γερμανία, ένα μάθημα ιστορικό που θα μπορούσε να μάθει από τη δικιά τη εμπειρία, θα ήταν ότι αν δεν υπήρξε δεύτερη Βαϊμάρη μετά τον Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο, έχει να κάνει με το πώ φέρθηκαν οι μεγάλε δυνάμει μετά τον πόλεμο. Που ήταν πολύ λιγότερο τιμωρητικέ απέναντι στου ειδημένου και λειτουργήσε με ένα πολύ πιο φωτισμένο αν θέλετε, τρόπο σε σχέση με το τι έγινε μετά τον Πρώτο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο. Και νομίζω ότι αυτό είναι ένα μάθημα το οποίο. Τουλάχιστον για μένα είναι πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον και χρήσιμο. Λοιπόν, θέλω να ευχαριστήσω του συμμετέχοντε στο πάλεν, να ευχαριστήσω και το... όλου εσεί που μα ακούσατε. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Καλό βράδυ.